Hello, I'm Bob Norton, CEO of Airtight Management, which is all about scaling companies, and the CEO and Entrepreneurship Bootcamp, which is about startups and early launch of companies. This segment is about the 10 main challenges of scaling and growth. These are generic for almost every company, and the systems needed once you break $5 million will take you all the way to $100 million if they're done right. We're going to discuss the risks, the stages of growth, and the problems with growth. Now, a company should never scale until its value proposition has been proven to the customer, and it has pretty firm marketing processes, sales processes, and operations processes for the delivery of your product and service. If you don't have these processes well-defined and documented, you're certainly not ready to scale yet. And I don't think that just knowing these challenges and traps will ever allow you to solve them all. What we're going to do is try to let you know what you don't know that is hiding under the surface. And if you haven't scaled a company to this size before, you will want a mentor or a coach and some advisors that have been there and done that to get to this kind of size of company before. So let's get started. Let's talk about breaking through some invisible barriers that most people who haven't grown a company before don't even know exist. The problem is that these problems or issues can really kill you and you don't know it. So I like to compare it to breaking through the sound barrier which killed a bunch of test pilots before they figured out how to build a plane to, to handle the disruption that was happening there. If you're growing a company for the first time, I can guarantee you there are hundreds of these unknown barriers that can get in your way. And finding these by trial and error can be fatal or limit your growth at a minimum. And it's far more expensive. Typically, a company should be able to grow at 50 to 100 percent per year if it's established and has a working set of processes for sales, marketing, and operations. More than that is quite a bit more difficult and generally requires you to have multiple management team members that have been in a rapid growth situation before, which you know would require more capital or more profit or revenue stream to support that typically. So being aware of those is the major goal of this particular course, to let you be aware of those things that could bite you without you even knowing they exist. So let's talk for a minute about the odds of reaching certain size in revenue of companies. This information is from the Kauffman Foundation, which is a great source of statistics on entrepreneurship. And what it shows is that only 4% or 1 in 25 companies will reach the lowly level of only a million dollars in revenues. Getting to 10 million revenues is only going to happen on average to about 1 in 250 companies. And if you go up to $50 million in revenues, you're talking only about 1 in 1,700 companies that will achieve that level. So this is a high mountain to climb and takes a lot of preparation, risk, hard work, entrepreneurship, and usually a very solid team. Although a single founder can build and run a million dollar company, it's very unlikely that one founder without a strong team is going to be able to build a company to 10 million or 50 million dollars in revenues. That's why startups have to use their equity and try to bring in very experienced people to help and complement the skills so that they have a, an experienced management team that bring many skill sets to the table that will be needed for growth. Now let's look at a model of how a company grows. A model is very useful in understanding when you need to adjust your management style planning horizon, risk level, and various other things that must change as a company grows. We at Airtight Management use a five-level model of growth. 
And the idea is that a, a level one company is a raw startup, very agile and easy and quick to change, not a lot of customers or legacy issues, probably just a little bit of revenue to start and still learning and validating their various internal processes. Because the goal of a startup is really to validate the business model and the customer need and the market. A company that moves to stage two, I would compare in this metaphor to a, a cabin cruiser. It's better run with multiple crew. It can't change speed and direction as quickly. But it's prepared to go for a longer voyage. As a company reaches about one to three million, very much dependent on the type of company, it needs to shift gears from that very raw startup, high risk, agile mode to a longer planning horizon and more process and procedure and management. As a company gets bigger than that, moving to stage three, it now has significant legacy issues with customers and things that it can't change and move as quickly. It needs to lower the risk uh, because the bets it's taking on its brand and its revenue and other things are, are getting bigger and bigger. The downside is getting bigger. Planning horizons for everything need to expand or stretch out, and you need a much more disciplined approach to goal setting for quarters and years and even a five-year strategic plan at this point with a, a stage three company. Like a fleet, a company can usually only go as fast as the slowest ship in the fleet. And in, in the case of a business, that's the department or sometimes the senior managers and how, how good and effective they are. And complexity, as you go through this five stages of development, gets exponentially greater. A stage four company, which we're not going to talk about a lot here because it's a much larger company, is, is uh, compared to an oil tanker here because it requires you know, miles of planning in advance to change and slow the engine and change direction. And then a, a very mature company, a larger company, that's a conglomerate with many products and services potentially is more like an aircraft carrier with a fleet of support ships. Lots of complexity needed in the management and planning and supplying of that ship. And you really can't take big chances with that because it's such an expensive proposition. So a startup must be, and when I say must, I mean it's because it's the advantage it has over every company, large or small, already in the marketplace. It must be lean and fast. It must be willing to adjust and change quickly, often called pivoting, as you learn more from the market, putting newer products and services into the marketplace. Almost never is it exactly as you had planned, the old battle phrase that, you know, the, the plan is a, a must-have process, but as soon as the battle begins, the plan is out the window, and you've got to make rapid adjustments. A startup should have almost zero bureaucracy. It should be a very flat organization. Sometimes I like to call it a benevolent dictatorship because the founder or the CEO really has to have their hands in all the pies and know what's going on to be able to make lean and fast and quick decisions. You've got to do things cheaply. A startup can typically do things at 10 or 20 percent of the cost of what a larger company might be with less people and quicker for many of the reasons that we're going to talk about here. Uh, you hire people just in time, and you're typically looking for 80% solutions. The 80-20 rule always is called the Pareto principle, almost always applies, and you don't want to spend three or four or even 10 times as much developing a product to serve the entire market as a larger company with hundreds or thousands of customers might have to, you really want to do it only to serve that 80% or best customer that you're targeting, which should be a niche as you enter the market, ideally a niche that bigger companies aren't interested in because it's too small, so that you can get established before you have head-to-head -head competition. Startups must be willing 
to take big risks, and they have the advantage of not having legacy issues. They don't have IT systems and customers that they have to support and lots of long-term contracts in place that would prevent them from doing certain things. So they really can uh, pivot on a dime. As a startup, you really must take advantage of all of these things to be competitive and to get established.